Every day, you get to a fork. Many times in the life, you have to make a decision. Every day, you have to make a decision, whether you go right or left. And there's no way back. Once you've made up your mind that you go this way, that's the way it is. So this is what I'm talking about tonight. And Jay asked me to tell you uh, what made me leave Hungary, my home, home country, and what, how did I get to San Francisco? The whole thing happened 57 years ago. I never thought about leaving Hungary. And then in 1956, there was a demonstration by the Polish people, and the Pol Polish people and the Hungarians were always very close to each other. Historically, we had the same king and same... Blah, 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 blah. So the, in <laughs> October the 23rd, the, the police uh, chief made a bloody mistake allowing the un Technical University for a, demo a street demonstration. The demonstration got out of the hand. The, the, the red star was ripped out from the flag on the street. The police last lost control of the crowd. Uh, the crowd, the university crowd, all of a sudden became like tens of thousands of people. One part went to the Soviet, uh, so, uh, went to the Stalin statue, which was a huge statue in the, in the hero's care. And I was, I was there when they welded the boots and the statue came down, which was unbelievable. You know, like two days before, there was a big fight in the police in the, in the radio station because the university student wanted to have the, to read the, the new rules what they proposed for the government. Nothing happened to that. In the morning, it was fight. The Soviet Union, Soviet army came in with tanks and it was a fight all over the city. The time came when Khrushchev decided to crush the revolution and it was a bloody, bloody fight in Budapest and in every major city in Hungary. According to my recollection, is about um, maybe a thousand, two thousand, two more, more people died. Later on, two, three hundred was hanged and shot by the, the new communist regime. And, two and, a half, and then the borders opened up toward Austria. So together with 250,000 other Hungarians, mainly young people, educated people, we took the road and we went to Austria. Well, to went to Austria, it was not the easy thing, as I said. It took about three days for us. I started out with a friend and my 17 years old stepbrother. We, got, we managed to meet several friends and the last day we walked in the forest. November is cold and rainy in, in middle Central Europe. And uh, when you went to the border, which was completely mined, and you hear the shotguns, hear shotguns there, and you hear a virus, you don't know whether the virus are cut. So they, we finally we got to the border, and the border was like at several hundred yards wide, completely empty, with towers and the virus. So we jumped over and we decided to go. And uh, when we got to the other side, there was a little forest, and um, there was a sign on the, on the on table in German, giving something for direction. And one of the member of the team, who became a very famous uh, restaurant owner, restaurateur in the city of San Francisco, and then later in Stanford shopping center, jumped up to kiss the table. So we slowly approached the village, because there the word is going like this, and we really didn't know whether it was an Austrian village or a Hungarian village. Middle, middle of the night, nine o'clock, so it was, it was Austria. So we went to the police station, they, we got a coffee, we got a sandwich, and then the bus took us to a larger village where, <coughs> where uh, we spent the night. It was jam-packed with refugees, for me, I was sitting in a movie theater all night, my first night in the free world. <laughs> so I was watching old American or German movies or whatever, but that didn't matter. Next day, we were taken to a railroad station and we went to Graz, which is the closest large city in that part of Austria. And it was an unforgettable picture for me. Uh, there were tables around 
and there's a, there's a coverage station, and the shouting. If you want to go to Eng England, come here. If you want to go to Switzerland, or Sweden, come here. And then there are 16, 17 years old boys said, Joe, where do you want to go? <laughs> and believe me, there in that resonance sta that station, hundreds of hundreds of lives were decided forever. Right? So anyway, from there on, we spent about two days there, and the Red, Red Cross gave us uh, tickets to go to Vienna, where we wanted to go. And then the Viennese Austrians were really forthcoming with the refugees. It was very difficult to handle for them. It turned out later that the United States of America reimbursed Austria plenty what they spent on us. But never mind, we got the, 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 the food tickets, we got some pocket, pocket money. If you were Jewish, you went to the joint. If you were Catholic like me, you went to the, the night of Maltese, and you, 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 you survived, all right? But uh, certainly my first, the first trip was to the Aust Australian embassy, trying to contact my wife. Uh, I didn't have any money. I came out as, as one shirt. I still have the shirt <laughs> and the ring and, and the heavy coat and the raincoat. I had nothing with me. I had some hundred Hungarian money, which was worthless as soon as I came out, in case I have to bribe somebody on the, on the border, which was not necessary. So I went to the Australians and I told them that my wife is in Heidelberg, which was the Olympic village in Melbourne, and uh, she's there. And because the Hungarians are going home with two chartered planes, I w <sighs> she was about 21 years old, and, uh, and I said, well, the, the, make sure that she doesn't go. So anyway, I went back about three days later, and um, I said, okay, your wife knows you are here. Do you want to go to Australia? Says the says, uh, interpreter. I said, well, I haven't been in Australia for a long time. Why not? <laughs> So, <laughs> so what happened that um, in those years, I still have the yellow booklet. I had to get about 15 shots for my, everything. You name it, I had it. So uh, I, and I got the railroad ticket to Salzburg. And this is shot, scotch or? <laughs> Next time, Jim. <laughs> Um, so, I, I went to Salzburg, there was a Camp Rue there, which was a, the uh, abandoned American military base. Next day to Linz, uh, get an airplane, and the Scandinavian airline system gave a um, plane for the Hungarian refugees. Uh, what the Austrians did, they loaded it up with Yugoslavian refugees, which they couldn't get rid of for years. <laughs> So on the plane, finally, I was the only grown up, 29 years old, and uh, the rest, there were about 10 university students with the plane Hungarian. So the flight took 58 hours, non-stop. I mean, stop. We stopped. <laughs> I tell you, tell you, tell you. I, I did, I, the, one thing I don't, I remember, I didn't sleep a, 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 a bit. Uh, and we landed in Rome, Abadan in Iran, Karachi, Bangkok, Jakarta, Port, Port, uh, uh, what is it, north uh, end of Australia, Port, Darby, Port Darwin, and then Melbourne. So I arrived in Melbourne, and the, the Hungarian, uh, everybody was Hungarian was out on there, with flags, with the Boy Scout teams, and you, you name it. It was a big time, the first Hungarian refugee plane. I was a refugee. So um, what I happened, my wife came out with another Olympic uh, gymnast. And the, um, which are, you know, it's really strange for me, the Australian uh, FBI immediately grabbed me. They put it in the living room and we went to the Olympic uh, camp. The reason for that was that the Soviet team was with a, a big ship called Gruzia. And those years, the, uh, the Soviet kidnapped many, many people in Australia. So the, the Australian FBI didn't let us to go out from the camp until the, the ship left. But at that time we had a ball. It was Christmas in 
100 degrees Fahrenheit, which, which is for a, a Hungarian, <laughs> but something, something unusual. By that time, I, which I didn't know, that uh, the, about 42 members of the team decided not to go back. And um, they get an invitation, Henry Luce, the owner of the Time magazine. Yeah, the, he was the husband of, of the Claire Luce, who was later ambassador, I think, in Rome. Uh, invited the, uh, the team to come over to America for a t uh, demonstration team, demonstration tour to visit, which partially was a promotion for Time magazine and introducing the Sports Illustrated magazine, because that was our sponsor. But look, we, on Christmas Eve, we boarded a Strato Clipper, the best airplane I ever flew, two floors, bed, and we played bridge in the lower one and, and dinner. It was fantastic. I saw one, that there's one, if ever you go up in Seattle, the Boeing, uh, are, there is one. So once we went up with my, my son to Seattle, I went there and I went into that, because whether I remember correctly. We had printed menu, we stopped in Fiji to refer to Canton Island, to Hawaii, and we arrived Christmas um, 11 o'clock to San Francisco, good night, the governor was there. I, somebody gave me a blazer because in, 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 in the tie. I just reprinted some pictures and I had the tie. And uh, the, the good night was there, Christopher was the, uh, he was there, the marine color guard was there, the music was there, the black limousine take me to, take us to the Mark Hopkins, and the first three nights in America as a Hungarian refugee, I spent on the 17th floor to the Mark Hopkins Hotel. <laughs> <coughs> on the courtesy of the... So we stayed here for two days. We were actually um, um, introduced to the Hungarian families here, and we spent the Christmas Eve with... Uh, I was in a very nice family in Sunset, and then uh, so forth and so on. So two days later, we flew to New York, then we were in the Central Park South in the New York Athletic Club. Um, it was big, big time. I mean, they really played it up. Uh, and that went on for two and a half months. And we, we visited every Ivy, Ivy League college. We visited every major city in America. Many of them had never been back, like Tulsa, Oklahoma, Houston, St. Louis, uh, you name it, uh, Kansas City, and we were everywhere. We started out, and you see the, the issue was that in every place, in every university, every college, the team gave a demonstration. That lasted for two and a half months, ended in San Francisco. And the deal was that Sports Illustrated was uh, offering everybody a job, a scholar, either a scholarship or a ticket anywhere in the world. And 12 of us decided to stay here, and I never left. <laughs> so.